Happy Friday. I love this music. It pumps it's me good. up. I love this music. I love Fridays. And I specifically love today's Collider Dailies because Chase is making his Collider Dailies debut. This was a long time coming. I'm very happy it's happening today because we're going to review some movies. Our audience might not be super familiar with you yet, though, Chase. So can you just give them a brief description of, of what you do at Collider? And wait, I want to add like a little bit of a personal touch to that. What yeah. do you do at Collider? And then I'm putting you on the spot. What's your favorite movie of all time? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I am an authority editor at Collider, which means I oversee reviews coverage along with all the wonderful folks there. And my favorite movie of all time is going to be what started out as a horror movie since today is a horror Friday but became like existential horror. And I'm going to sound very maybe pretentious about it, but I really love Synecdoche, New York, Charlie Kaufman's movie from a while back. It's just one that's always stuck with me. It's like hard to revisit because it's very intense, but mm -hmm. it's, it's up there as my top movie. That was quite the tee up. I had no clue where you were going to land with that. And then, okay. Yeah. Get behind I think that. It, it's interesting because everyone knows uh, Eternal Sunshine, which he wrote, and some of his other movies. But for me, that's like just one of the most interesting, expansive, bold, challenging, painful movies that that I just can't ever forget. Yeah. Would recommend. I don't. I don't blame you. Pretty much the polar opposite of my favorite movie of all time, Jurassic Park. <laughs> hey, you know. That's what we love about this stuff, though. Yeah. Um, I'll give a brief disclaimer. If anybody hears any crackling on my end, it is not my internet connection. It is not my microphone. It's the fact that my cat is obsessed with not boxes, but bags, paper bags in particular. And I will not take them from him, even to preserve the audio of the show. Our two topics today are very exciting ones because they are movie reviews. We are going to split the show between two movie reviews. The first one is going to be a review of Late Night with the Devil. So just in case you need a little 101 on that, I'll read the official synopsis for the film. October 31st, 1977, Jack Delroy's syndicated talk show, Night Owls, has long been a trusted companion to insomniacs around the country. But a year on from the tragic death of Jack's wife, ratings have plummeted. Desperate to turn his fortunes around, Jack plans a Halloween special like no other, unaware he's about to unleash evil into the living rooms of America. Um, late night, uh, with the devil is the recently is the, oh, the, I get this now late night with the devil is the recently rediscovered recording of what went to air that faithful night. So they're, they're turning it into found footage basically. And that's what it is. Chase, I'll let you do the honors first. Uh, more broadly, what did you think of this movie? I, I really liked it with you alluding to the found footage element, in some ways, it's not quite that. And that's kind of the least interesting part to me. But what really works is that it uses this familiar language of TV about a late night show that, sorry to burst anyone's bubble, is not real. All of these questions are scripted. All of the interactions are scripted. And then it's like, what if that came undone? What if this sort of contrived horror thing actually started to happen? And the ending is where that really, really becomes something great that I won't won't talk about, but I really, really liked it. Yeah, I thought this was pretty fantastic. And and it was deeply chilling, too. I, I talk about this all the time. I, I watch a lot of horror movies and, you know, very few nowadays give me the creeps. When this movie was over, I, I got up from the room that I was watching it in with other people and went downstairs to, to a rather dark area to, like, get a drink. And, you know, like... I'm like a little like what's like what's around the corner, but I I thought this was exceptionally well executed. I think it's I think it's a great movie for anyone out there who might be sitting there thinking to themselves like, ugh, I don't need any more found footage style movies in my life. I don't. I've seen enough um, possession movies. I've seen it all. But but you haven't because this leans into the tropes that we know and love so much, but it puts it in like a really unique, fresh setting that adds new layers to those types of horror movies. And I think it was just so incredibly clever and well done. And the joy it brings to my life seeing David Dasmalchen headline a movie and do it so damn strong. He is pitch perfect in that role and that is the kind of character that needs a pitch perfect performance 
And it's honestly kind of wild that this is his first leading role. It feels like he's just been such like a integral part of every movie he's been in. And so to see him really get like this, what I had said in my review from last year's South by Southwest is this is his stage. He's really running the show. We get to see him playing this character who's like insecure, but kind of weirdly charming, but like really coming apart. And he, he has to navigate a lot and then shift in and out of the onstage persona versus the nervous host offstage. He does a really, really good job. Yeah, I mean, that what you're kind of uh, getting at there, I think, speaks to the fact that a lot of the scares in Late Night with the Devil aren't just scares for the sake of scares. They're all heavily tied to, to specific situations and characters, and it gives the movie that kind of, like, lean-in quality, wanting to know if... if Jack is like a good dude or a bad dude if he is like misguided in this whole situation and also kind of wanting to play along with what's happening in the show within the show like is this really real like I caught myself looking all around the screen for for little tells and hints and clues and then you're believing it's it's a really highly engaging film that lets you play along which I always appreciate in any movie and I want to give a shout out to the way the show is constructed mm -hmm. from the sets to the way it's shot to the costumes to the layout. It's like Carson or rather someone desperately trying to be like Carson, which is very much the point of him chasing this acclaim and fame that he's not getting. So he's turning to desperate means. And I, I think it really works. And I think as that all builds together, as he ignores all these warning signs and everything comes apart. It's really, really great. Yeah, the the visuals I think were absolutely spot on, and that's not an easy thing to combine. They they basically give you the show within a show, as though it is found footage, and you know that that is shot the same way a show of this time period would be shot. But then it'll cut to black and white behind the scenes footage, which. I guess can't quite be found footage. All the like I was trying to track that camera work to see if maybe someone could be shooting that in the moment, which so whatever, maybe it could be found footage. But I feel like editing wise, that's not an easy thing to execute in such a seamless way where it feels so natural. And I think a lot of their choices in that respect work really, really well, where it, it all it all felt like so fresh and dynamic and it all felt so right together, which I think is a big accomplishment here. Yeah, I will say that I think the the shifting to the black and white behind the scenes stuff, I think the closest thing to call it is found footage, but it's not really quite that. It's sort of like it's gesturing towards that, but there's never really an acknowledgement of the camera. To my recollection of it, it's sort of just observing from afar. Yeah. And there are cuts between different angles. So I don't know if that quite, I don't know if that quite is as interesting to me as then when we shift back into the performance, but I still, I still like what it's going for and trying. I don't know what it would be to, to call it sort of a late night approximation yeah. of like behind the scenes footage, but I don't, it then is, we discovered this footage, it's being rebroadcast. I don't know. It's I it's feel, an interesting one. I'd be curious what other people think. I feel like you needed that kind of stuff, though. Like, usually I'm a big stickler for, like, if you do found footage, you never break from it. That's, like, the yeah. one, that's, like, the one top-tier rule you must abide by. In this particular case, I do think the behind-the-scenes uh, scenes really in, enrich the, the, the atmosphere and what they're doing in terms of making a show. And obviously that in turn adds layers to the character and his mentality. So I don't think that's something you could have accomplished in show in during which he has that like more performative nature to him. Yeah, it's about his performance shifting back and forth between I'm on stage trying to sell this and the cameras are off. What am I doing? How are we making this work? All these people are talking to me the guests that we're bringing on are concerned that we're taking this too far and I'm sort of just ignoring it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I appreciate that part of it. It's just going to be interesting to hear kind of if this gets considered as like top tier found footage movies, because I, I think it's up there. Yeah. If you consider it found footage, but that's kind of a, it's a classification thing. It doesn't really matter that much. For what it's worth, I consider it found footage and I would put it in, in the top tier of found footage films. Um, I'm surprised no one brought this up, but we, you know, we, we don't live under a rock. We're well aware of the, the news discourse about this movie right now. And the fact that the filmmakers did use AI to, to generate, but then alter further alter three images in the movie. So so we did want to address that briefly. So Chase, you're up first. What is your take on that matter? 
it's such a bummer because the movie is a good movie and all of the other human creativity that goes into it is great. I think, and I hope this will be a learning experience for the filmmakers to maybe not do that again. They released a statement yesterday saying they'd done this two years ago before the strikes where this was like a very important existential question for the medium. I don't, whether people sort of accept that or not, I'm hoping that this ends up being something that they say, we tried it, we maybe didn't really think it through, and now we're going to kind of focus more on the other elements. And we just came back from South by Southwest where crowds were booing mm. the things of AI every time it was like, AI makes us more human and this is the, the future. And I kind of get that. I really do. I think that the most interesting parts of this movie are not those images and that that image has kind of dominated the conversation is a sign that focus on the, the human craftsman, hire a graphic designer. That would be wonderful. Yeah. It's not, it's not a reason to, I think, dismiss the entirety of the movie, but it's worth talking about still. Yeah, no, it, no, it is. It definitely is. You know, I've, I don't really know anything about the specifics in terms of the behind the scenes, the timeline the movie was made in exactly, nor how, how hiring was considered and how this whole operation was structured, the budget they were working with, the constraints they were working within. But, you know, I keep, I keep thinking about how, the last year in particular with the strikes and trying to to protect human artists rights going forward from the use of AI like we've we've experienced a, a greater learning curve with AI than ever I do think there's been a an awareness for the risks of using it for for many years now but I do think the truth of the matter is more recently that's where like the alarms have been sounded on a widespread level and people are really like sitting and taking the time to, to read up and understand why these things could be a major issue and should be avoided. So I'm a little hesitant to be like, I don't like, don't watch this movie because two years ago, maybe they made a misguided decision. But I think that leads into exactly what you were saying. If, if you make mistakes, then use it as a learning curve. So my hope is that so much of the focus being on this particular issue with the movie just makes people rethink using tools to make a job faster, easier, rather than hiring an artist who deserves to have their work shown on the big screen. So this is a great, great movie that I very much enjoyed and will likely watch over and over again. And it's also one that should be seen because you know, dozens, if not hundreds of very talented human beings contributed to this film in a multitude of ways. And I want their work to be to be seen and to be celebrated. So, you know, m my hope is that the positive of this situation is that people learn that human made art is better and it's just better to pursue that route. So that is where we land on on Late Night with the Devil in terms of our review and that particular issue. You ready for our next one? I'm so ready. I'm so happy. This is such a horror filled show, too. It like not only is it a double review episode of Dailies, but two horror movies. Our next review is going to be for Immaculate. The brief synopsis for Immaculate Sydney Sweeney stars as Cecilia, an American nun of devout faith, embarking on a new journey in a remote convent in the picturesque Italian countryside. Cecilia's warm, Warm welcome quickly devolves into a nightmare as it becomes clear her new home harbors a sinister secret and unspeakable horrors. So, Chase, do you want me to go first on this one? Yeah, go for it. All right. I like this movie quite a bit. I Everyone out there knows I, I love horror. I love, love, love horror. And I have a great appreciation for some iconic classics in particular, I, I keep referencing like late 60s, 70s, early 80s for something like this. And I think it channels those movies like quite beautifully and respectfully. I loved the simplicity and the elegance of Immaculate. And I, I think I think it matches those movies in terms of, of its visual visuals and how the imagery is stylized, but also in terms of pacing and you know the time taken to have a, excuse my language, a holy shit ending, but building to the point where you earn those, those wild, outrageous, disturbing situations and horrific visuals. I think it does all of that 
I mean, really exceptionally well. So I highly recommend Immaculate. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. It's been interesting because this has become a little bit more divisive mm -hmm. of a movie, I think. <laughs> and I think it's because some people felt it didn't. I, I had read one review that I'd never seen someone say this, that they wanted more exposition. They wanted to know more about mm -hmm. her character. But I think for, for folks that don't know, it's very efficient in terms of her character is someone that was spared from certain death as a child. She thinks this is divine. That's what motivated her to come here. And it is kind of that all collapsing around her. And I can't talk about the ending because it's best experience with no idea what it is. But I think there's a moment in the middle, too, that I can talk about a little bit where she's trying to find her way out. She comes up with a very clever solution that then culminates in, I think, a really striking scene in a field. And it's like little moments like that that really, I think, work. And I think her performance is maybe the best she's ever done yeah I, not like a large amount because i think reality that she was in a couple years ago was great but this mm -hmm. is this is quite something this like this is giving every ounce of your not that reality is not but this felt like someone giving every ounce of themselves and then some to a role but you know going back to what you said again no spoilers here but that part in the middle of the movie is something that i really appreciate because a lot of times we, you know we, we sit back and we watch horror movies and we're like you idiot like why would you do that I really appreciated that there was a really smartly executed plan in the midst there. I re I really loved that, but like she is she's like a true powerhouse. Like you can't watch a movie like Immaculate and then walk away and say to yourself, she's not a movie star. Like she's not an anchor to a film. This film there's a lot of wonderful things happening in this film and some great supporting performances that I also really enjoyed and and I think supporting performances that make a big impression with a lot less screen time which I think is very difficult but there is no denying that Immaculate rests on her shoulders. If she can't if she can't pull you in with with Cecilia's kind of like warmth and big heart at the beginning and and her enthusiasm to to build a new life in this convent the the rest of the movie is not going to work but then on top of that she has to like oh so delicately go from from that you know like wide-eyed woman we see walk into the convent to like the absolutely feral state we find her in at the end and she has to do that all in a believable manner and that's not easy and she pulls it off like extremely well i can't imagine her doing more than what she did in this movie oh absolutely i think not that awards matter too much like the art speaks for itself but when we talk about like horror performances often being overlooked for awards i think this is probably one of those that's up there where it's like very much built around her, that kind of slow, gradual shift in perspective, in faith, in belief, without really calling attention to itself, without really overstating anything, with having some moments of dark humor that I think really work. Mm -hmm. I won't say what it is, but there's one like exclamation that she gives towards the <laughs> there end. Was, there was one line yeah. and I, I like cackled. That was I great. Help it. <laughs> And so that that all works because it's jokes that are not like winking to the audience, but are just like, oh, man, it's like it's bound up in this journey that she's on. I really liked it. I hope people also have perspectives on it and get a chance to see it soon. I, I don't know. I'm worried it could get lost in the shuffle because there is the first omen that's coming out that is like a sequel to or a prequel to another movie, whereas this is its own original thing that draws from these influences, but still the ending in particular is unlike anything that you'll probably see this year. I don't want to oversell the ending because I think the rest of it is good too. And don't want it to be that people just expect. Oh yeah. To go. Cause like they released a trailer of basically a lot of the ending and are like, this is amazing. And it is, but I think the rest of it is also quite something too. Yeah. I mean, I, I love how I'm about to say, I don't want to overstate it as you just warned, but I do have to be honest and say, I think, I think the ending of this movie will likely wind up being one of my favorite scenes, one of my favorite shots of the entire year. I, I keep calling it a filmmaking feat because it is one on so many levels. It's it's a standout performance beat beat like in the midst of many other standout performance beats. But like that is like a top tier one. But then also <laughs> What every single department needs to be doing in order to pull something like that off is like a really, it's like a next level filmmaking challenge. And 
I appreciated the moment. I appreciated how it served the movie in the context of the film itself. But I also look at something like that and like you could practically see like fireworks going off around me while I'm seeing this shot unfold in such like a well executed manner. So I do have to tee it up. I can't help it. It's great. No, I'm 100 percent with you. And your interview where they had talked about how this was the first take of the shot. Great. Amazing. Ow. It was so good that they were like, perfect. <laughs> wow. They did two, only two takes. They definitely, I'll bet you anything, they did that take and we're like, shit, that's great. We're just going to use this first take. We but have to, do, we have to do one more for safety or something, yeah. but they, they knew what they were doing. I mean, that's one other broader thing that I really appreciate about this movie is that, you know, we were kind of just talking about this with uh, Late Night with the Devil, too. It's not horror for the sake of horror. You could watch this movie and watch every single frame in it and know everything was crafted with, with distinct purpose and detail. So another shout out to Michael Mohan, the director. And, you know, I I thought The Boyers was, was pretty good. I enjoyed watching it during lockdown. But this is very clearly a step up for the two of them as, as collaborators in this industry. So I want to see them make more together. Yeah, I was just about to say that. I hope they make another one. All right. With that, we have given you two reviews that you could see in theaters this weekend. Because clearly we would both recommend both movies, Late Night with the Devil and Immaculate. Chase, before we say goodbye, I always ask everyone to do this. Can you tell everybody in the audience right now something you've worked on recently that you're proud of and you want them to check it out when this episode of Dailies is over? It would probably be a review of another movie that's coming out today that people might not know as much, but it's called Do Not Expect Too Much from the End of the World. I won't say a whole lot about it. It has the best title, also a fantastic ending shot. It's about this woman who's driving around as a overworked, exploited assistant for a production. And it's so good and so funny and very effective. I would recommend seeking it out however you can. That's That's been the thing that I enjoyed and was most proud of working on recently. You piqued my interest the second you uh, the second you told me about it. I've got that oh, one yeah, on the radar. Yesterday, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were talking about commuting. And it captures that. As someone who had a horrible commute, this captures that like so well and it's like painful but really really effective i i'm gonna check that out i like the sound of that um i'll take a quick moment to say that if you enjoy horror movies and if you're still here you likely do the next two south by southwest interviews that are going to go live that i did on the collider interviews channel are so immaculate was one of my favorite films of the festival these two mark two others and i also think they're going to wind up being some of the best horror movie well i guess one's not full horror but oddity is phenomenal that interview goes up shortly and then after that so torn that's a little more of a crime thriller but you know it's got violence and blood in it so i'll say it's a genre movie but both are are well worth keeping an eye out for and i highly recommend watching those interviews because they've got a couple of artists attached to it that are very much on the rise in a special way so now is the time to get to know them so go check those out and with that that is a wrap on this week's Collider Dailies. We will see you Monday at, I have to remember what coast I'm on, 1 p.m. Eastern for a brand new episode of the show. Have a good weekend, everyone.